Hello, everybody, and welcome to our podcast, The Future Finance. Uh, today, our guest is Joseph Egan. Uh, he, um, hi, Joseph. Uh, he was recently the president of Polychain Capital uh, and very recently left to form his own firm called Acme Crypto Holdings, uh, which is an investment firm specializing in blockchain. Um, we also have as a co-host, Dennis Tsai. He is the co-founder and, um, uh, and co-head of Ethereus. Uh, it's a Taiwan-based blockchain protocol development company uh, with whom uh, Deep Macro has a very tight uh, strategic relationship and partnership. So um, let's get right into it. Um, Dennis and I will both be asking questions of Joseph, who has really graciously made himself available for our podcast. Um, Dennis, why don't you uh, kick it off? Yeah, um, I just have a quick question. How did you get yourself into the crypto industry to begin with? Yeah, uh, good place to start. And thanks to you <laughs> both for having me on today. Uh, great to be here and always fun to talk about crypto. Um, so I began my career in traditional finance. I did the typical post-grad out of college investment banking two-year program, and then went into the hedge fund community directly, first as an investor research analyst and portfolio manager um, within the merger arbitrage and event-driven investing space. In 2008, I transitioned from the investment side to the business and operation side of hedge funds first seeding emerging hedge fund managers, and then later as the COO for a long short equity hedge fund based out of New York. In 2017, I decided to leave the hedge fund space um, altogether and try and rethink where I could take my career. And it was um, through that, really through some form of luck that I was introduced to Olaf Carlson Wee, who was the founder of Polychain Capital. Um, and it was a friend of mine who was in traditional finance, investing his own money, who told me that he thought I should get into cryptocurrencies. And he called me up and said, um, I, I know this great guy. He's in San Francisco. He started a hedge fund. It's really small. Um, and it's in cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. And I said, all three of those things sound insane to me. I just left the hedge fund community. I don't want to move to San Francisco. And I don't know what crypto is. Um, so I nonetheless went down the rabbit hole of investigating crypto. And um, within a couple of months was uh, moving my family out to San Francisco to join Olaf at Polychain Capital. And we had an amazing ride there building that firm um, from one of the first crypto investment firms in the venture space uh, to really one of the biggest investment firms globally now. Um, and I recently left in uh, April to join my own firm with a few other partners within the crypto space. Wow. Um... Is there a specific uh, industry that you're targeting now that you've started your own fund? Um, not in the really an industry specifically within crypto, but certainly yeah. crypto broadly. I think mm -hmm. when we think about crypto, we are very much interested in seeing the growth of this very nascent technology. And we mm -hmm. emphasize that we view this as a development of a new technological stack as opposed to just a disruption of currencies. And I think this is a very important distinction to make. We don't view Bitcoin to be gold and Ethereum to be silver and et cetera, et cetera. We in fact think of crypto and blockchain technology as a disruption of computation. So we can talk more about this going forward, but we want to invest in things that enable greater and greater computation on the blockchain. And the other thing that we're very much interested in is the increasing democratization of finance globally. Um, and by that, I mean the increasing democratization of financial products that are created and by who they're created and the increase of number of people that can access those financial products. So if you think about a somewhat simplistic um, or, or base analogy today, um, Goldman Sachs, since the middle of financial transactions or another investment bank, they are the ones who create the financial products and they're the ones who allow people in to those financial products. So for example, my mother today would probably be unable to invest in a hedge fund um, on the Goldman Sachs platform or anywhere else because her net worth is too low. And at the same time, she's unable to create a financial uh, security or commodity because she doesn't work at Goldman Sachs. So what we are very much interested in is expanding the use case of who can create financial products through things like DeFi and who can access those financial products through an open financial system, again, created by DeFi. And so if you think about that now, we can have more and more people globally 
whether you're, uh, I don't know, a, a trans woman in Zimbabwe or a white dude in Massachusetts, you have equal power to create financial products and access those financial products without the need of a bank account. Um, and increasingly, we will see, I think, a financialization of more and more of these global assets, right? So as NFTs and fungible assets become ported onto blockchain technology, more and more of these things will be able to be used within the DeFi ecosystem. And then more and more people will be able to aggregate their wealth and use these financial tools and products, again, without the traditional rails of a financial system. And then, you know, we can go forward to think about what that means for broader economies and broader technologies. Right. Well, this one, this question of mine is more of a uh, personal one because we're always knee deep in technology, working on you know blockchain protocols. So, um, how important do you think it is to um, display the technology you're working on versus trying to make it more user friendly to the industry? Because as you know, um, it's still quite a bit of an onboard for people to use uh, Ethereum, for example. They have to go acquire ETH. And then they have to learn the whole decentralized wallet thing before they can actually try even doing any DeFi. Yeah, this is yeah. An, an amazing aspect of crypto to me. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the reasons it's so surprising how successful or how exponential the growth has been within crypto is that all of the growth that has happened within DeFi is mm -hmm. despite, excuse my French, the really <laughs> shitty interface. Right, yep. like over the past 18 months, DeFi has basically grown from something like $100 million in smart contracts to over $100 billion, right? It's probably the fastest growing ecosystem uh, within technology that we've ever seen. And yet to do it, you need to, to your point, buy the digital asset, download the wallet, send the asset to the digital wallet, be able to connect that digital wallet to a DeFi um, Web3 uh, protocol, and then potentially continue to do other more and more recursive borrowing, lending, pools, et cetera. It is incredibly difficult in that one sense. And so one of the things that we are interested in, as I mentioned about Acme before, is increasing the pool of people who can access crypto more easily, right? So it's both increasing the people who can come in and then also increasing the products that are able to be available on in, uh, blockchain technology today. And so one of the things, um, as we think about that difficulty is that despite that difficulty, we still have about $110 billion today in DeFi, and yet only about 2% of the global population has accessed cryptocurrencies. So if you think about that massive growth of 2% to hopefully 100% of the world, we then have this also continuing massive explosion of growth within the DeFi ecosystem as more and more developers create easier to use wallets, disrupt the wallet interface altogether, create more financial products, with those easier to use wallets and so on and so forth. The other thing I'll say about DeFi is that there is another aspect that is way more user-friendly than the traditional ecosystem. So while technologically it's difficult to understand how MetaMask works, you don't actually have to understand that, right? If you think about Uber today, you could argue if you don't know how to use a, a phone that Uber is actually fairly difficult. It's even more difficult if you wanna understand all the hundreds of transactions that go once you click that button to send the driver to you. Right? Uber has done a great job of abstracting all of that away, and eventually we will get there in crypto. But today, you can basically take out million dollar loans in DeFi without a bank account, without a password, and instantaneously on a blockchain protocol like Solana or Ethereum, or um, soon to be Polkadot and many of these other emergent blockchain ecosystems. And so if you think about that relative to the process of having to get a mortgage today, right? I, call my mortgage broker, they KYC, they AML me, they um, make sure my financials are all in order. I take probably you know months of emails going back and forth. I finally get my bank account open, then they approve my mortgage. Then I have to do the title search. And you know four months later in New York, at least, you actually get to close on your house. You could today go take out a million dollar loan on Compound um, instantaneously and do that okay, without so, a password and without a bank. <laughs> Joseph, I want to take you up on that. I um, uh, I started my refi process in February, and um, <laughs> you don't know how many times I've gone through uh, this whole thing. No, that you're you're right, and I think um, you know money itself. There's a huge technological chain behind dollar bills, uh, and we don't think about it. Uh, and so getting to that point. 
uh, is is really important. I, I totally agree. Um, and if I may break out, break in, um, you know, there's a lot of hype or excitement about uh, the metaverse, um, things that are purely virtual, um, like N NFTs or digital assets, let's say. Um, with um, deep macro and Ethereum, we're we're more interested in looking at kind of real asset um, tokenization uh, or things that actually um, financial products uh, that are on the blockchain itself uh, that do have uh, value and utility and let's call it the real world. I don't know that that's the right distinction, but I think you kind of get what I mean. Which direction do you lean toward? Do you think that we should lean toward? I mean, the world is leaning toward one or the other. Is there space for both? Um, tell me a little bit about how you uh, come down on that question. There's absolutely space for both. And when I talk about the increase of people coming into crypto and the increasing financialization of products on both ends of that spectrum, one of the things I think is really interesting to your point is how you get more and more real world assets ported onto the blockchain. And at the same time, more novel assets are created um, natively on the blockchain because of the blockchain technology, right? So the blockchain technology will enable novel human behavior that we still cannot even consume or consider today. So to your question directly, I think we are going to see a massive uptick in what NFTs can accomplish in terms of their actual technology. Today, NFTs are largely considered to be digital art by the masses, right? If the New York Times is writing an article, it's about why they think CryptoPunks are a ridiculous enterprise. And I can talk for days about why I think that's incorrect and they're probably undervalued. At the same time, I think what people miss is that it is a non-fungible token, right? That token can be associated with anything from digital art to your Michael Jordan rookie card, to your house, to your bottle of wine, to your Patek watch, to your data set. And so I think data here is an interesting, uh, perhaps use case in between real world asset and native digital assets, right? Data today is something that let's say Facebook utilizes uh, to sell ads on their platform, right? It is your information that they use to then distribute to other people to generate revenues for themselves. So today this is theoretically a real world asset as it is already somewhat financialized, but it's financialized by a third party, not by you. I do think that over time, data pools, individual data sets, things like your Instagram post, your tweet, um, all of these things that we consider to be sort of the proprietary ownership of centralized companies today will eventually be associated with an NFT. So if you think about, um, I don't know, your Google search or your Uber ride, each of these things could conceivably be an NFT that through blockchain technology could be owned privately by yourself. And so now that data set that I own, as opposed to a third party owning, could actually become more valuable. Today, I think data is actually wildly undervalued because third parties are managing it for you in massive data pools. Now, if I own that and someone wants to reach out to people who are, I don't know, something like 43 with brown hair and into cryptocurrency, they know exactly you know, what my data set looks like. They can read that depending on what my privacy settings are and specifically target me more and more based on my individual nature. And so that data becomes more and more powerful as I can control that more and more myself away from those centralized entities. So I think that's number one is more and more things will become represented by NFTs, both in the real world and in the metaverse, and also in these sort of middle categories where today they're online, but could be valued far more highly, I think, than they are by the current uh, economic ecosystems. Yeah, I mean, I kind of foresee all these different blockchains becoming like a central registry where you would go and check for, you know, nominal ownership of NFTs and anything like that, right? But um, given that there's more and more chains, how do you think that works in the future? I mean, ideally, it would be nice if there was just one place and we go look at Ethereum and say, oh, you know, Joseph owns that and, you know, Jeff owns that and Dennis owns that. But once it becomes a multi-chain ecosystem, how do you think people will work around that issue? Yeah, so I've always been of the belief that we will live in a multi-chain world. I think yeah. it's inevitable um, that, you know, I don't think there'll be hundreds of chains, but I do think that there'll be um, a number of chains that all have perhaps varying use cases, right? Mm -hmm. We can talk about the deep technology of scripting languages, of consensus mechanisms, Right. There are all trade-offs within any of these blockchains. Right, Ethereum um, has perhaps more security than Solana. Gas fees are higher. Transactions are slower. Right, so even today there are these trade-offs. 
And I think we will continue to see those trade-offs. And so depending upon what you are trying to build as a developer, you will continue to see certain of these ecosystems grow in technological power and prowess. At the same time, we're already starting to see increasing um, cross-chain communication through things like Cosmos and Polkadot, but then also through other technologies where different chains are being bridged as opposed to connected through a central hub and spoke model with things like, um, I don't know, like Connext for layer two or Dbridge for a cross-chain um, communication. And so over time, a lot of these technologies and the cross-chain nature of it will be abstracted away from the user base in the same way that that Uber ride today, right? The deep tech stack is abstracted away from the user so that I can send you, you know, Polkadot or Ethereum or Solana across any number of chains to any wallet that you have, regardless of what the base of that wallet actually is. So we are, one of the things that we're very much interested in today is the expansion of that, uh, let's say cross-chain communication and how that enables novel cross-chain interaction with both fungible and non-fungible assets. Um, at the same time, we're in a deeply chaotic time where number one, there's a whole array of layer one blockchain technologies that are emerging with new developers building on top of them. At the same time, you've got layer two with Ethereum and many, many projects on layer two. And then you've got interconnectivity between many of these different technologies. And then you've got different compilers that compile different languages from one blockchain to another. So developers can move one tech to a, another blockchain quite easily. So I think we're, we're in this chaotic phase where in addition to all of that, you've also got several novel layer one technologies that are in development today that will be released over the next 12 to 36 months. So I do think that there will be a period of chaos where developers are almost unsure themselves of where to develop. But at the end of that tunnel, I do think that we'll have a user experience that is far faster, still very secure, and also far easier to use, really to the, the original the question here today. Okay, interesting. Um, so I wanted to pick up on the, the theme you mentioned at the beginning about democratization, uh, and especially global. Um, and, um, you know, one, uh, I don't know if you'd call it, a, it's hard to say what it is, but um, uh, DeFi and, and, and DAOs, distributed autonomous organizations. Um, I mean, they are distributed, uh, they are autonomous, they're kind of semi-organization. Um, could you please explain a little bit what you, th you think, how, what, what DAOs are, and are they the real way that, this, is this really the leading edge of how we're going to democratize uh, globally, wherever we are? Yeah, um, I would say this is, um... This goes beyond just technological innovation, and it goes to a certain level of economic and social innovation as well, right? So if you think about what we've been talking about so far, it's a novel tech stack, right? Web3 is recreating a whole user experience based on simplistically Ethereum or other layer one blockchains. It is not like fintech, a shiny new UI on an exchange, right? Robinhood is um, a, a, a shiny new uh, interface that makes it easier to buy and sell stocks. It's not a redevelopment of the tech stack. What we've been talking about today is an entirely new tech stack, really for the first time in 30 to 40 years. But on top of that tech stack, I think there's another layer of innovation to your point, which is these DAOs. And many, there's many, I would say, a, a wide array of definitions of DAO. But to me, a DAO is most simplistically a disruption of the corporate structure, right? You are taking an entity, you are decentralizing it, and you are putting the path forward or the governance of that entity in the hands of the holders of that token. So one of the things that I think is incredibly interesting within DeFi is how they began this innovation of distributing the tokens to the users of the protocol to incent people to come and use the protocol. Okay, so I'm gonna take a step back now and talk about Web2. If you think about Uber, Uber is a company, it's run by executives and it's owned by, let's say hedge funds, right? <clears throat> Simplistically speaking. Those people hold equity and they probably don't use Uber all that much, right? They probably are flying around in their private jets. And then myself and a bunch of other people were using Uber in New York City and San Francisco every day. And we probably don't hold the equity, right? So you've got two circles that are not overlapping with the equity holders and the users of that protocol. The executives and the hedge funds want Uber to raise the prices of that transaction so that more money flows through, margins go up, the stock is worth more. The users of that protocol want that 20% fee to go down so their ride is cheaper, right? So you, you've got 
a corporate tension, as I call it, between these two non-concentric circles of users and equity holders. If you fast forward to DeFi, an example like Compound or Uniswap or any of these DeFi protocols, what happened was they had investors, they then distributed a token in parts to those investors, but then they usually at 50% distributed the, that 50% of the token to the people who came and used that protocol. So if I, Joe Egan, went to go put money into the compound pool, I would earn those comp tokens. So now more and more, you're taking these two circles and conjoining them together. So the people who are coming to use compound now and earn that token now have a right in the governance of that project going forward. And because they're both using it and deciding the path forward, they want lower fees in those transactions. So that overlap in the concentric circle of the holders of the token and the users of the protocol mean that you have a better, I think, better path forward. To me, I call this, <clears throat> it's a little bit of a, a long-winded title, but to me, this is um, capitalism without the corporation and communism without the state. And this is one of the great novel capitalistic or economic innovations I think we will see of the next 90 years is how we can actually create a novel economic system through DAOs. And now DAOs are going to start disrupting more and more corporate type of entities as opposed to just these decentralized lending pools or decentralized financial tools. So you're starting to see the emergence of DAOs for things like ownership of NFTs or ownership of financial assets, or really I think over time, the disruption of hedge funds generally through DAOs or generally <coughs> disruption of uh, decision-making broadly speaking. And then going forward, you'll start to see DAO governors, people who are you know, very specifically getting delegates of votes because they know very specifically about, I don't know, art in NFTs or you know, wine and watches in NFTs, right? So over time, we'll start to see the emergence of these DAO you know, politicians and governors <clears throat> where they're micro experts within each of these ecosystems. But I do think this alignment of interest between token holders and users of these DAOs or these protocols or these DeFi protocols will be a massive economic movement going forward to really, I think, recompress what we've seen in sort of the disruption of the elites versus the, the common folks in our world today. Wow. Okay. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, um, so uh, one thing that got a lot of attention recently was uh, they're calling it the Constitution DAO, uh, which uh, uh, bid at an auction of a rare copy of the U.S. Constitution. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a bit of publicity stunt element to that, it seems. Um, didn't quite make it. Um, but could you maybe use that as an example to elaborate uh, uh, about what these things are all about? Yeah, so in this example, a group of people, a decentralized group of people, effectively a global group of people, pooled money into a vehicle and voted on how to um, basically try and win that constitution, um, which is a real world asset, somewhat ironically. Also potentially that asset was, um, if we wanna get kind of meta and philosophical, the first attempt at um, decentralizing you know, monarchy globally um, and, and to own that in a totally modern, both corporate and technological structure, I think was, um, both quite hilarious, but also amazing that that decentralized group was actually quite coordinated um, and you know almost won in a somewhat amazing fashion. And so I think um, while they didn't win, they still proved to the world that these types of organizations can be wildly successful. Um, and it highlighted also to the world that these DAOs exist, where I think in many cases, people did not even realize that things like this could begin to occur. I think the other thing that it highlights is you know, potentially what fractionalization of financial assets could mean to the world going forward. And I think this is perhaps outside of the PR and getting more eyeballs on crypto and DAOs and blockchain technology. This is really a core, core lesson here. Um, fractionalization of assets, I think, could also lead to more and more financialization and wealth generation across the world. If you think about um, a real world analogy today, uh, if you have a hundred million dollar house, there's only so many people in the world that could own that particular asset, right? You have to have a wealth of probably a billion dollars, have a really successful, you know, financier at a bank that's willing to finance that, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you fractionalize that, you open up the world of buyers to people who can afford portions of that to a great degree. So maybe I want to own one one thousandth of that house because I think it's going to appreciate in value. So now you've actually probably increased the value of that house because you've increased the buyer set. 
but along with that comes other um, necessities, right? The buyer um, of that fraction might want to one day re-aggregate those fractions and put it back into his own full ownership. So there are still many steps in the path of fractionalization, um, but that fractionalization at the end of the day of general asset ownership will afford more people the ability to own a greater array of the world's assets. Those assets will become far more liquid. Um, those assets will hopefully become re uh, put together a bull. And then also um, because of all of that will become far more liquid, right? So you've got something that's worth more, that's far more liquid um, and is far more accessible to all of the world. I think that is an amazing use case for this increasing financialization and democratization of the world that I keep talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree on that. Um... Are we underestimating, though, the uh, difficulties in um, kind of the legal aspect? I mean, ownership, um, you know, creates rights and, and obligations. And um, um, I think that some of these efforts so far, uh, you know, they've been out there. Technologically, it's possible to tokenize a lot of stuff. And, you know, here and there, there are projects that are done. Um, is it what is preventing it from like really kind of catching fire? Uh, is it really uh, is it the more legal um, regulatory aspects uh, that need to get sorted out first? Um, or is it just a matter of the market, you know, this global community uh, getting used to the idea of, hey, I can actually do this? I would argue that it's caught fire and there's rocket fuel on the fire and it's exploding wildly. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I take your point, but I'll, I'll just paint the other picture. <clears throat> which is okay. The growth in DeFi that we've seen, for example, or the growth in users of crypto um, or, you know, all of these metrics that you see, <clears throat> excuse me, of this massive growth. And if you just look at the underlying technology and the growth that we've seen of numbers of founders coming to our space, there is this massive boom happening. That said, we are still you know, very much in the early days, you know, some would argue in 2000 to 2004, like where we were in terms of users of the actual internet. So I do think we still have to get more and more people into this crypto ecosystem and get them comfortable with some of this decentralization, but really do that by abstracting away a lot of this technological difficulty as we talked about earlier. So yeah, I, I do think that um, there are uh, technological burdens to getting people in. There's obviously some of these, um, uh, you know, it's I would say it's harder for us in the West to see the great benefits, right? I trust my bank most likely in the US, right? Yeah. It's harder for us to see the benefits of this redundancy, this security, this um, greater de decentralization of computation versus someone who's you know potentially seeing um, rampant inflation in um, you know some sort of uh, Saharan African country or you know in Venezuela or wherever you're seeing this uh, sort of uh, massive massive inflation or you know who's able to get bank accounts and who isn't. So I do think that the benefits will potentially accrue to um, people globally outside of, uh, let's say, the U.S. Um, first, and that might actually be one of the leaders of this technology going forward. That's great. Um, I, uh, at my local supermarket, I saw a small baguette for $9.50 last night. So <laughs> I don't know if this is hyperinflation, but it's something I had not seen before. Um, and I'm sure you get it in Paris for, you know, uh, a fraction of that. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's hope, um, you know, that, uh, that we don't get into that situation. But I, I do know that um, at the central bank level, um, you know, there's a lot of consideration about uh, what um, you know, crypto will mean for payment systems, um, and then also whether uh, having a competitor. Um, you know, uh, I don't think that anybody would argue that crypto will make fiat currency irrelevant, but there's been a lot of work that, well, maybe having a competitor will make it a little bit more honest. So um, that's kind of a little bit off our beaten path. But you know, your comments on the DAOs and stuff, um, I think, is 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 really spot on too. Um, I don't know. Do you have any? Suppose that um, you know I were uh, you know just getting into this. Um, what would you? How do you advise people? Uh, you must have a lot of young people come, and and uh, um, what should they be doing in crypto? Uh, yeah, I, I would say there's a whole array of things. Listen to the Deep Macro podcasts would probably be number one <laughs> on that list. Um, you know, learning any way you can is great. Watching webinars and the YouTube videos and listening to the podcast. There's a whole array of great content out there. Um, but at the same time, there's nothing like actually interacting with this technology. So I would recommend to people, I'm not an advisor, I'm not a financial advisor here, but you know, for me, what I tell my family is that 
go buy um, some Ethereum on Coinbase, send that to a MetaMask wallet, and then see where you can find different interest rates at different in different financial products. But you're right. I mean, I do have hundreds of people now on a daily basis reaching out, asking how they can get involved, how they can learn more about this technology. All of the people that told me I was a fool in 2017 for getting into crypto are calling me, asking me for jobs. So the, the transition is here. It's upon us. Um, and it's definitely best um, to you know really learn by doing and to get involved um, in the space. Um, so there's really not any one thing, but there are more and more, I would say, technologies that are working on ways to get people in gradually, you know, through things like gaming, um, which I do think will be one of the big draws, right? I think gaming is probably one of the biggest economies globally that no one really appreciates and understands. And many of these games now are being built on these blockchain technologies. Um, and as people realize that they can now you know, basically take ownership and financial ownership in some of these assets within games, I think you'll start to see a broad migration of gamers that pull other people into crypto, um, as opposed to DeFi, which was sort of the first thing that pulled uh, people into crypto. Um, Dennis, I can't let that slide. Dennis is a, is, is is the game guy. Uh, um, any uh, any follow up there? No, I think he's absolutely right. I mean, the game angle is going to bring in a lot of the young kids that will probably create a completely new financial instrument out of the gaming things that are coming out. Right, we're seeing sandbox with like virtual real estate. Right, um, I can imagine uh, kids having items and assets in in the digital world in the metaverse, and maybe even lend, even lending it out. Uh, stuff like that just probably you know just flies by us really quickly. But the kids will pick it up, and the, you know proofs in the pudding. There was Axie Infinity is the first uh, kind of play to earn kind of model that's coming out. And I see a lot of people starting to follow that model these days. Oh yeah, look, I think the, the, the whole disruption of gaming is one of the great examples of you know the combination of financial assets, the metaverse, gaming, and regular fungible tokens on the blockchain, right? If you think as me as a game developer today, I can pre-sell NFTs that are items you can use in my game to finance the game without ever having to raise money from a venture firm, a venture studio, a you know, corporation, whatever it is, I can build that technology. I can then launch the game. People can use these NFTs in the game. If they're successful in the game, they like the game, maybe they wanna hold those NFTs because they think that they're gonna appreciate in value as they did in Axie Infinity, as you just mentioned, or maybe they wanna sell them to other people. Um, and then there's a project that we invested in called Fungify, where you can actually take NFTs today, put them into a lending pool and take out a fungible token, right? So I can now own non-fungible assets, take out a loan and go buy a house, right? So these financial use cases of things that you can do with NFTs of in-game assets is really massive. Now, if you take that yet another step further within crypto, I think we will have an enabling of the um, creator economy, not just being for the creators on TikTok today, but for everyone globally. Like I think you'll see a disruption of labor forces of as you have the Dowification of corporate entities, you'll have the disruption of labor forces, which become far more liquid. And each of these labor forces now can become their own content creator. So me as a gamer, I can go and buy those financial assets. I now am a holder of sort of like the economic ownership of that underlying game that I'm playing. I'm even more wed to that game. I'm even more interested in playing that game. I can then create clips of me being successful in that game, sell them as an NFT myself. I can control my own content. I don't distribute it through YouTube. I distribute it through a decentralized video protocol. Right now I can start creating these contents. Maybe I'm a, a member of a DAO that all co-owns all of that um, data that I, or the content that I create, right? So now each of us as individuals can become the owners of our own content that we can create regardless of what our expertise is. And this, this decentralization allows for greater and greater expertise and people to distribute that expertise to people who need that expertise through these more efficient um, labor markets, whether it's gaming or otherwise. Okay. Yeah, I'm also starting to see more DAO as a social entity more, as opposed to having a DAO as a protocol. What do you think about that? Because uh, already are social entities, 100% agree with you. Um, I think I mentioned CryptoPunks earlier and how some people are flabbergasted at the price of a CryptoPunk. What I don't think people recognize is number one, how 
art progresses over time. And this is just a novel advance of art. And many, many people who see that don't think it's great because they think the Mona Lisa is beautiful. And other people who see that think the Mona Lisa is terrible. And why would you go stand in a sweaty museum to see that when I can just look at my amazing pixelated art, right? So there is an artistic element to this. And what I think will be really interesting is how AI changes the face of art going forward. It's going to be absolutely fascinating. That's a whole other podcast we can do. Yeah. Then, then from there, the ownership of that gives you social status itself, right? It has become its own um, sort of social status tool. If I have that as my, you know, my Twitter picture or whatever it is, my avatar to gain, et cetera, et cetera. But then from there, you can actually use these NFTs to then create social DAOs where people create chats on Discord um, and eventually the decentralized version of Discord. And these communities are wildly vibrant, right? If anyone is a member of any of these communities, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The amount of high quality information and content that is existent within these Discord communities, where by the way, you need typically that NFT to gain access to that community is absolutely massive. So people are now paying to get into these communities where you have this social interaction that you have, you know, think about um, uh, what's it called? Um, Wall Street bets, right? I mean, imagine if Wall Street bets to get in, you needed an NFT. Um, in that case, Wall Street bets would be worth way more than Robinhood, right? Robinhood's failure was that they didn't keep the chat on Robinhood. People go to Wall Street bets, spend the entire day there, scrolling through, scrolling through, making a bunch of hilarious comments, creating some amazing ideas. They spend 10 seconds on Robinhood executing the trade and they go back to Wall Street bets. Imagine if you could monetize that. You can, you can do that today through these sort of NFT based DAOs. So that social aspects to the DAO is I think a massive movement that is just beginning. And people I, I think outside of crypto don't realize how big it is, except they do because they're probably all on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think you're right about just the sheer uh, volume and I would say quality of the uh, information flows throughout any of these networks or um, social groups, uh, as you say, um, and there is a real social element to it. Um, these are different than social kind of media networks, I think. So, um, well, well, they are different. And I think one core difference is Instagram or Facebook in those examples, you know, they are effectively DAOs that are controlled by yeah. one centralized entity. These DAOs are controlled by the people who own the NFT. It is a, I mean, the DAO itself is the one who controls that content, who controls that data. It's not left to someone else. So when we were talking about, you know, I don't know, if I'm an advertiser and I want to advertise to someone who's a CryptoPunk holder for some reason, right? I think that community is very interesting to me. I know specifically how to gain access, what their likes, what their dislikes are. I can now say, okay, everyone who owns a CryptoPunk gets, you know, a, this $100 off your next purchase here. Right. All of a sudden, the power of that DAO is not just the social aspect, but it's what other people, right? This is where data becomes more valuable, right? It's if you own your own data, you then are a better provider of that data to people because it's self-directed, not corporate directed. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think, again, it's the next step of the evolution. And I think it does have some real powerful advantages. Um, uh, Dennis, anything else from your side? No, I think we covered a lot of ground. Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, Joseph, it was really fascinating. I really thank you once again uh, from Deep Macro and Etheris. Um, let's uh, chat again sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, guys, for having me on. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you All right, talk you. to you soon. Yep. The content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained in this material constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by Deep Macro Incorporated or any third-party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments in this or in, in any other jurisdiction in which such solicitation or offer would be unlawful under the securities laws of such jurisdiction. All content is information of a general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual or entity. None of the information constitutes professional and or financial advice, nor does any of the information constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or law relating thereto. There are risks associated with investing loss of principle as possible. Some high-risk investments may use leverage, which will accentuate gains and losses of securities or firms' past investment performances not a guarantee or predictor of future investment performance.